Last week, we installed and configured a net USB cartridge device, which allowed us to get on the internet and surf the web. Now this week, we're going to look at the opposite side of the equation, which is the USB part of the net USB. Now USB as a protocol was released in January of 1996. And the first devices started appearing around about May of that year. So again, this is this paradoxical situation where we're trying to enable a technology on a computer that was introduced 11 years before USB was created and was almost at the end of its lifetime in 1996. So it should be interesting to see what we can get working. And as usual, we're going to head over to the ST, which is over there. We're going to start by installing drivers and utilities for the device. Now I've already copied the installation files over to the ST using the UIP tool that I showed you in the last video. And there are two versions of the files that I found. I found a version five and a version six. So we're going to go with version six. Now inside our version six folder, there are several subfolders. We have some documentation, which is always a good thing. Some extras that we'll have a look at in a bit and two sets of executables. There's the ST version, which are built for the 68000 processor and the TT and Falcon ones built for the 68030 processor. So since we're running on an STFM, we'll choose the ST folder. In there, again, we have two sets of drivers, one for the Mint operating system and one that covers both Vanilla Toss and Magic. Now this week we're working on an ST that uses Magic as its multitasking system and Genie as its desktop. So we'll be going into the Toss Magic folder and installing stuff from there. As usual, installation is just a matter of copying some files. We have some auto folder content and an accessory. So we'll install the accessory first. We'll go into Gemsys, then into your accessories and drag the USB tool into that folder. Now we need to install our auto folder apps. So what are we installing into that then? There are two sets of apps that get run that are part of the USB stack. The first set are the kind of architectural level ones. USB.PRG is the lowest level of the device stack, and that needs to execute first. And this provides the core API for the drivers to use. Then we have a series of individual drivers for different device classes. And then finally, we have the NetUSB.PROG app that needs to run after all of these devices are installed and actually scans for installed items. Since all the folder items run in the order that they're inserted into the folder, we're going to add USB.PRG first. Now we're going to add the drivers that we want. Now I don't have a tablet to show you, so I'll skip that driver, but I'll take the others. Order of these isn't important, so I'll just drop them all in together. Now it's worth bearing in mind that these drivers take up memory. And if you're not using a particular device, don't put it in. Now later, I'll be renaming some of these to PRXs so they aren't loaded and don't take up any memory, but we'll get to that in a bit. Lastly, we'll copy over the netusb.prg file. Now, since we're using Genie, and if you want a little reassurance of the order things are going to run in, we can list the files in text format and we can choose show and sort it in the menu. And this will show you the raw execution order. And looking at the list, all is good. And now we'll reboot to get all of those programs loaded into memory. And let's just say some sequences are shortened for dramatic effect and the avoidance of boredom. So here we are post reboot. Let's have a quick squiz it boot.log. Scrolling down, we see it's installed the USB core API. The keyboard driver is shown as running and the mouse driver and the printer driver and the mass storage driver. Finally, you can see that the net USB app has ran and it's scanned for attached devices at boot time. It's found the net USB root hub, a USB keyboard, and a Kingston HyperX Pulsefire Dart mouse. Ooh, fancy. And then it just outputs a little message to say it's finished initialization. Right, to show you guys that the keyboard and mouse are working, I'm gonna open QED. And yeah, that shows us we have a problem. With the USB stack loaded and Magic and Genie running, we don't have enough memory to run QED, and that's a problem. Now, this USB tool accessory, it just runs in the background and scans for changes on the USB bus. And that can cause some issues with stability. And one workaround for that is to rename the accessory to usb 2 xac And when you do that, it'll only scan for changes when you open the accessory, not every second. But for now, I'm just gonna delete it. And that should 
after a reboot obviously, free up enough memory for QED. But don't think of that accessory as gone forever. Like Arnie, it'll be back. Okay, reboot turn. Now I can open QED and show you this working. And hey, look at me, Ma. Multi-camera action. We're getting posh on this channel, aren't we? So in QED, you can see the mouse is working and the keyboard. That's all looking good. Keyboard and mouse through USB in 2024. Now, if there's one thing that this experiment has taught me is that this configuration with QED running, I only have 31K free out of a total of like 4096 on the machine. So if we go into Magic's Task Manager, you know, pressing Control Alt and Escape, we can see QED using 1.1 megabytes of memory and the total associated with it and all the other apps is around about two megabytes. So Magic and those device drivers are using the other two megabytes. I think I need to find a mem an editor with a lower memory footprint. If you have any recommendations, please let me know. Right, back to the desktop. So we have USB mouse and keyboard working. Am I gonna keep using them going forward? Well, no. I already connect a wireless mouse via a, this dongle that you can see, and it uses no memory, needs no drivers, and just works when you turn the mouse on. And I guess if I wiggle that, you can actually see that the ST will support multiple mices. Mices? <laughs> multiple mice. Also, I quite like the mushy keyboard on the ST, so no. Right. So that was keyboards and mice uh, sorted and very good. So now we're going to have a look at printing. And this is the thing that in a way excites me more than most things because I haven't been able to print from an Atari ST since I graduated for the last time in 1993. So let's see how we do that. So once again, let's go back over there. Okay, I've unplugged my keyboard and mouse from the NetUSB and I've plugged in my printer. Let's see if it's recognized. So opening the log, we see it's detected a Samsung Electronics Company Limited ML1865W printer. That's my black and white workhorse of a laser printer that I've had for over a decade, I think. Okay, so in the NetUSB install files folder, here are some goodies. And there's a print application for simple text files. We're going to drop that on the desktop and I'm going to speed through this, but I'm going to give it a custom icon. I'm going to specify the app as print.ttp, its desktop icon. I'm going to give it a pretty icon. Now, sometime later, that icon is going to disappear and I'll never get it back. Genie is just a little buggy when it comes to icons at times, but never mind. Now, we're going to print something by the magic of drag and drop. So more fantastic multi-camera action here. And here are the results. That's basic text. And the way the net USB driver works is it kind of intercepts the parallel port. So it really is printing just like it's a dot matrix back in the day. Now, what I'm going to do is spin up a more advanced word processor, shall we say. And I'm going to print its test document. Now, the pages came out about every 30 seconds or so. So about two pages a minute. And that's a little slower than that printer's 18 page per minute speed on a modern computer. And as you can see, some formatting happened. So printing, sorted, and kind of impressive. Now, I would have liked to have been able to do something a bit more fancy, like a papyrus document with lots of nice graphics and stuff in it. But unfortunately, the memory constraints on my ST just don't allow me to do that. But perhaps on another video, I'll show you how that's done. Now on to storage. It's strange, but in every one of the videos that I make, there's a part of it that feels like it should be easy, but that ends up taking an inordinate length of time. And for this video, that was storage. And as usual, it was my own stupid fault. I mean, you saw me delete the USB tool accessory earlier? Yeah. Guess what you need to have running to make it work? <laughs> yeah. Here's how it should work when you've worked out your deliberate mistake. The first step we need to do is to create an image to burn to our thumb drive so the Atari ST can access that image. So what I'm going to do is take one of my template hard drive images created using ICD Pro, and I'm going to write that to the thumb drive. That will give us three drives available to the ST. A 32 meg first drive, a 256 meg second drive, and a 232 meg third drive. 
And obviously the drive letters will be assigned depending on what other hardware is plugged in. So for us, they will become, I believe, E, F, and G under Magica. If we wanted to transfer files in this case, we could actually mount that hard drive image into Hatari, transfer files hosted on a Gemdos disk and put them onto that and then move it across. Right, so I'm gonna load that image into Belena Etcher. I'm selecting my thumb drive as the target, being very careful not to select my two terabyte Final Cut Pro drive. And I'm ignoring the message about it not being bootable and I'm writing it. Now this thumb drive is lightning fast on the Mac, but hey, that's not gonna be a factor on the other side of the equation when it's plugged into ST, believe me. Let's get over to the ST. Before we get to rebooting to see our USB storage device in action, we have to sort of face some facts about my computer and talk about memory consumption. We only have 737K bytes of free memory on this ST when we're fully loaded up for NetUSB. So that's a fraction of the full four megabytes of memory. And really you want around about a meg and a bit to run large apps like QED. So what I'm gonna do here is rename some of these drivers and apps so that they're not actually loaded at boot time. I'm gonna speed this up and I'll talk you over what I did after. So now all we have left loading on the net USB side is the USB driver, the storage driver and the net USB tool. So let's reboot and once we're back, let's see if we have more than that 737K free. And yep, we have just over or just under rather one and a half meg available to us. So that's not too bad. So let's have a look at the boot log. And there are three components, as we would expect. So the next question is, did it find my three partitions on the thumb drive? There they are, mapped as E, F, and G. Now you might be asking the obvious question, so where are they then? They appear under you, but are they on the desktop? And yep, here they are playing peekaboo behind this window. Oh, and by the way, if you notice, as I said earlier, the printer tool no longer has a custom icon. Let's stick the E drive down here for a little experiment. I guess you might be wondering how performant this USB thumb drive adapter is. I mean, I know I am. So let's talk about our method and procedure for today's lab test. I'm gonna create a test folder on the NetUSB's drive, and I'm gonna measure how long it takes to copy the auto folder from the C drive into it. And in this part of the video, I'm not gonna shorten any of the video clips so you can get a feel for how fast it is. This first file is quite large, and so it takes a while to complete. And then overall, the whole process took 13 seconds. So now let's compare that with the speed of my SD for ST unit. So I'm gonna copy the same auto folder from C onto D. And I mean, this is actually disadvantaging the SD for ST because it's both reading from and writing to one device. But I mean, technically this could be slower, but I don't think it's gonna be. And in fact, as you can see, it was more than twice as fast at 5.3 seconds. You might've noticed as this video has gone on how I've been using just two devices plugged into the net USB. I haven't had a USB hub. And a USB hub is what they recommend that you go with. But I've got a bit of a cautionary tale about this. So I bought a USB hub, a powered one from Amazon. It's somewhere up there. And I plugged it in and it seemed to be working fine. And then I noticed something really weird. So I started when I was switching my ST off, all of a sudden I was getting bombs across the screen and the the screen was still persisting, but very wavery. And at first I thought that was my uh, video capture card being a bit of a weird thing, as it can be. But no, I, I unplugged that, plugged the monitor directly into the, uh, into the ST, still the same thing happening. And then it twigged on me that, oh, the USB hub was actually feeding five volts of power in to the ST, and that was keeping the screen persisted. So yeah, that was scary. I went cold when I realized that. So that uh, USB hub, that went in the bin pretty quickly. I mean, metaphorically, I'll use it for other things, but you know what I mean, scary. Right, I think the net USB has proved itself to be really, really reliable and capable. Uh, it works with keyboards and mice, though I won't be using that because I already have solutions for those. 
But where it comes into its own and where I will be using it in the future is for printing. Printing, well, like I, I think I've said several times in this video, just wasn't available to me for so long. So I'm just so happy to have it. And for storage, well, if I didn't have uh, an SD for ST, then I would use it and it is usable. It's just not very fast. But anyway, that's all for now. Thanks for watching and I will talk to you soon.